Well, as I've already told you several times, we are breaking into John 17 this morning, so I'd like to begin by reading uh, just the first five verses of the prayer, but uh, I do want to warn you in advance, we're only going to look at one verse. And by the way, the title does not, uh, yeah, the title does not really comprehend what we're looking at. Sometimes you just can't find titles that... Uh, are going to incorporate everything except for one generic title, Jesus' Prayer for His Church. Okay, that brings everything in. But that doesn't actually, it's not specific enough to, to really tell us what we're going to be looking at. So anyway, what I'd like us to focus on are several things, but as I already told you, the main thing that I've been focusing on in the service is the right motive for prayer, which is the right motive for life. Let me begin by reading the first five verses of John 17. Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Now, again, there's so much in those five verses, there's so much to look at that we we're not going to be able to look at, at everything that's here in, at one time, so I'm just going to break it up and we'll look at the different themes as they, as they arise in this uh, text. May the Lord bless um, and grant us His Spirit as we look at what He does have to tell us in the first verse. Now, just by way of reminder, Jesus is with His disciples in the upper room uh, where He has been preparing them for His departure. Yes, the Lord Jesus Christ was leaving, he said. Yes, they would grieve because they loved him. But he said he would come to them again, and that would bring them great joy. Now, he would come not only personally, he would come personally because he was going to rise again from the dead. They would see him. But he was going to come spiritually with the help and in the presence and the person of his Holy Spirit to guide them and to give them power. Now, the Lord Jesus said He wasn't going to leave them as orphans. He was going to come again to them, and the Holy Spirit would be that guide. He would be that Father. Our Lord Jesus Himself was going to continue His ministry from heaven. His completed ministry meant now different things. Things were going to change for His disciples. For one thing, He was going to have completed that work by which the Father now was able to love the disciples as his own children. It's not that he didn't love them because he had already been applying that work of our Lord Jesus Christ to them even before he went to the cross. That's the way grace works. He could apply it backwards even as he applies it forward. But now that would be consummated. Now the work would be completed. Jesus told his disciples the Father loves them. And he had prepared a place for them also in heaven, in his home. And he would adopt them as his children and eventually would bring them there. But Jesus also told them now they could come directly to the Father. They no longer had to ask Jesus, Jesus, would you ask the Father for me for this? Jesus says, you can now go directly to the Father and ask in my name, and he will give you whatever you ask. The fact that Jesus was leaving would ultimately be to their advantage. Now they were going to be better able to do the work that Jesus had actually called them to do in honoring Him, in honoring the Father, by taking the good news of the gospel to others. And by the way, we saw these same blessings are still here. The Lord has still provided them for us. We have the Spirit. We have the same relationship. We have essentially the same calling. And we have our Lord Jesus Christ who is basically working from heaven so that we might do His work here on earth. But having given them these assurances to bring joy 
to bring comfort to their hearts in light of the loss that they were about to experience, Jesus now turns his attention to prayer. Now, I think we all recognize that this prayer is unique, especially in the fact that it is the longest recorded prayer that we have of Jesus that he offered in the Bible. And here we have Jesus as our great high priest who is about to offer up his life that he might wash us of our sins, praying for us so that the work that he was about to do on the cross might be applied to us, that it might have its desired result, that it might bring about that relationship that Jesus is praying for in this particular text. So here is Jesus' prayer that the church might be established, basically that we might be incorporated into the body, that we might be a part of the body of Christ, that there might be such a thing as the body of Christ. Everything that Jesus does in his ministry was to establish the church in the past and throughout all ages. But this is the work that he did. This is the prayer that he offered so that it might actually come about. Now, there's at least three ways that we can benefit from this prayer. I would imagine just about every aspect of it. First of all, there are things that we can learn from this prayer to help us in our prayers. You know, Jesus is our example. And so we can follow this example. Secondly, as we listen to what Jesus has to say, it can encourage us because of the great love that Jesus expresses for his church. Let's make sure that we don't keep it out there somewhere, that there's a church somewhere that Jesus loves. We are the church if we're trusting in Jesus. This prayer is is for us. And so we should be encouraged when Jesus is praying these things, he's praying them for us. And thirdly, we can know that because Jesus prayed these things and because the Father always hears what the Son asks Him, if we have trusted Him, we have already received the blessings that Jesus is actually praying for here. They are ours in the Lord Jesus. Now, as I've mentioned, these first five verses are so full, we're not going to be able to look at all of them. We're just going to go through uh, verse 1 this morning, verses 2 and 3 this evening and verses 4 and 5 next Lord's Day morning. Now, this morning, we actually see several things in this first verse, and I don't want you to get lost in the fact that there's so many points here because we're just going to deal here briefly with each one, but I think each one is is helpful. We're going to look at Jesus' directness in prayer, His posture in prayer, the direction of His prayer, the recipient of His prayer, His request and his motive. There's six things, okay? But again, each of them we're going to deal with briefly. Now, we read in verse 1, Jesus spoke these things. Those are the things we just looked at in those first four of the five chapters. The last chapter is, is, is all prayer. And lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son." that the Son may glorify you. Now, first in this verse, we see Jesus' directness in prayer. One thing, if you were to read through this entire prayer, there's one thing you would see that is clearly missing, which wouldn't come at all as a surprise to us, and you won't find it in any of his prayers, and that is confession of sin. Jesus never had to confess sin because Jesus is perfect. He didn't have to begin by asking the Father for forgiveness. He could always go directly to the Father. Now that's, again, the directness of Jesus' prayer. That's something that we can't do the same because the same is not the case with us and won't be with us as long as we live. We don't believe in perfectionism. Except in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are perfect. We have His imputed, His credited, His given righteousness to us that makes us perfect so that we can stand before the Father, perfect in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But personally, we're not perfect. We still have a lot of imperfection. We still have sin. So we have to confess our sins. When we pray, we need to confess. We need to repent. And in our hearts... We need to renew our purpose to do what is right. We need to repent of every sin, not just some. It needs to be all of them because if we're not repenting of all of our sins, we're not really repenting of sin, are we? 
We're giving these other things up for some other reason. It has to be all or nothing. That's the way it is in the kingdom of heaven. Everything that we're not doing, that we should be doing, we need to repent of. Everything that we're doing that we shouldn't be doing, we need to repent of. And if we don't, we need to understand the Lord tells us that He will not hear us. Not that He can't hear us, but that He won't hear us. Isaiah writes in Isaiah 59, verses 1 through 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor is His ear so dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden His face from you, so that He does not hear. When we come to the Lord, we do need to confess our sins. We must be willing to repent of our sins. We must be willing to repent of all of our sins and to follow the Lord Jesus, renew our desire to follow Him. Now, secondly, we see Jesus' posture in prayer. You know, we talk about the different ways in which people prayed in the Bible, and sometimes we don't know exactly how they did. Sometimes they're bowing their face to the earth. Sometimes they're prostrate on the ground. Sometimes they're lifting up their hands and their eyes to heaven. But I do want you to notice the way Jesus prays when He prays to the Father. He lifts up His eyes to heaven. Now, one thing about Jesus that we admire was His boldness. Jesus had a kind of boldness in His prayers that came from who He was, that came from His relationship with His Father because Jesus lived a kind of life where everything that He did was pleasing to the Father. Everything He did was offered to the Father freely, and everything He did He knew was honoring to His Father. And He experienced at every point in His life the love of His Father because of that. And so He knew that His Father was always ready and willing to hear Him. And so Jesus lifts up His eyes to His Father and He begins to pray. Now again, what about us? Well, we can, and there are times when we can't. It isn't always the case. When we pray, and I think particularly when we're confessing our sins, I think we would do well to take a posture that actually reflects what's in our hearts that would be humility over our sins. Perhaps we would do well to take the posture of the tax collector when he went into the temple to pray, you remember how our Lord Jesus commends him for the way that he prayed and told him, or basically told his disciples, that he was the one who was actually forgiven, the one who was actually justified. Well, what is it that he did? Well, let's read about it in Luke 18, verses 10 through 14. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. The Lord would have us to humble ourselves when we come to his, in, into his presence in prayer, humble ourselves over our sins. But does that mean that we, we always are having our, as it were, our face to the ground when we're speaking to God? Well, not necessarily. Because once we've confessed our sins, once we receive forgiveness, once we have that, as it were, righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ, which we have at all times, of course, but once we've dealt with our sins, we can look up. And we do see in Scripture examples of the saints looking up. As a matter of fact, uh, in our call to worship, Psalm 123, verses 1 through 2, the psalmist writes, To you I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord, and to the Lord our God, until He is gracious to us. 
Now, in the Lord Jesus Christ, when we're clothed with His perfection, when our sins are all forgiven in Him, with Jesus as our mediator, we can look to the Father as our Father. We can look to Him as our hope, our source of hope, our source of mercy, our source of grace. We can look to Him for help, and He will hear us. And, as we saw before, He will give us everything that we ask for because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. So we see our Lord Jesus, His directness, and we see His, his posture of looking up to His Father. Now, thirdly, we do see also the direction of His prayer, which is going to be heaven, because that's where His Father is. Why is it that Jesus looked up? Why is it that we should look up? Because that's where the Lord is. That's where the Father is. That's where, in this, for us, that's where Jesus is. And one thing I want to point out, too, is that even when we come to the Lord in prayer, even like the tax collector, when he wouldn't even look up, but he was looking down, we have to remember he wasn't looking down into the core of the earth to pray. He was bowing his head, but his, his eyes and, and the, the, as it were, the, the, the sight of his faith was still directed toward heaven. Even when we are looking down, we should still be looking up, at least in our hearts, looking up to the Lord for His mercy. And we do that because that's where our Lord is. We address our prayers to God, who is in heaven, and Jesus, who is in heaven. The one who has taken his place between us and God, the one who will bring us to God, open the doors of access to the Father. So that's why we look up to heaven for their help. Now, fourth, we see the recipient of Jesus' prayer. Again, he directs his prayers to the Father, and so should we. Last week, Jesus told us his Father loves us. He loves us as His children. He loves us directly because we are adopted into His family because of the work that our Lord Jesus Christ did. We don't have to ask Jesus to ask the Father. We can ask directly in the name of His Son, and He will give it to us. Jesus says, ask. Jesus encourages us to ask the Father, to ask for whatever we need so that our joy may be made full. Whatever you need, make sure you pray. Make sure you go to the Father with that request, and the Lord will hear. John Bunyan once wrote this, and it, it, it has actually two very good uh, points of instruction. He says, you can do more than pray after you have prayed, but you cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. Now, again, I hope you see the instruction there. If you haven't prayed, you need to pray. Okay, so make sure you take those requests to the Father. Jesus isn't saying in the most dire circumstances you may bother Him, but leave Him alone otherwise. No, go to the Father. Unburden yourself upon Him. Everything you need, every one of your concerns, cast all of your cares upon Him because He cares for you. And He will hear and He will answer in the name of Jesus. If you haven't prayed, make sure that you pray. But if you have prayed, make sure that's not all you're doing, right? Sometimes we think all we need to do is pray, but that isn't all we need to do. If, we're praying, if we want our neighbors to be saved, we need to pray for them, but we also need to go to them and tell them about Christ, right? Uh, if, if there are people who need to repent of their sins or people we need to deal with, whatever it may be, we pray, we ask for the Lord's help, but then there's something else we need to do. But anyway, the point I want us to see here is that if you haven't prayed, you need to pray. You need to go to the Father. This is very good advice. Now, fifthly, we see the, His petition, our Lord's petition. He says, the hour has come, the hour of temptation, the hour when our Lord would lay down His life, the hour when He was going to be handed over to His enemies, when He would be rejected and condemned and nailed to the cross, the hour when the Father was going to lay upon our Lord Jesus Christ our sins and nail Him to the cross and pour out His wrath upon Him for our sakes, where Jesus would suffer and die in our place so that He might, in His great love, save us from the punishment 
that we so richly deserve. Let's not forget, we deserve that punishment, not Jesus. Now, since that hour had come, Jesus prays that the Father might grant him the grace, the strength to carry out that work. His request is, in verse 1, glorify your Son. Now, it may seem like Jesus is just simply saying, Lord, uh, you know, Father, lift me up into heaven and grant me glory, which is what he's going to be saying in verses 4 and 5. But I believe the glory that he's talking about here with which he's asking the Father to bestow upon him is the glory that, or basically the, the, the strength to be able to make it through that particular path that leads to that glory. In other words, to walk that path, to make it to the end, to do what was necessary in order to reach that point of glorification where the Father would bestow that glory on him. The strength to go to the cross, the strength to suffer, the strength to die, to atone for our sins, to set us free from death, to crush Satan, his power, and his kingdom. Jesus is asking for the strength and the ability to be able to do this. And, of course, he's praying for everything that follows. After I have laid down my life, Father, raise me up again. Take me up into heaven. Clothe me there with that glory and that power and that authority that you promised me. Now, why would Jesus need to pray for that? Well, because Jesus here is praying as a man. He, he is God. He is the person of that Man, Christ Jesus, but Christ Jesus is, let's not forget, a man. And as a man, he was dependent upon his Father. And so he prays and asks his Father for the grace to be able to do what it is he's about to do. And then sixthly, we see the motive behind it. And again, as I pointed out, this is perhaps the most important thing to see here. Why it is that Jesus is asking him for these things, which appear to directly benefit the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not because of Him. It's, in other words, He's not the focus so much of his, of his prayer as His Father is. He says in verse 1, glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. So even though Jesus was asking for things that would personally benefit Him in doing what He had been called to do, His goal was to honor His Father. We don't see Jesus praying, Lord, give me, give me enough money to pay off these people who want to kill me and give me enough to live comfortably for the rest of my life. I mean, he's not praying for things that are, you know, self-centered, self-oriented, but the purpose behind it was the glory of his Father. Now, by going to the cross, that's exactly what Jesus was doing. That's, you know, that's why he was praying for the strength to do it, because in going to the cross, through that sacrifice in his cross, he was going to glorify the Father, first of all, by, of course, satisfying the Father's justice. Man had sinned. If God was going to grant mercy, there had to be a payment, and nobody could make that payment. But the Father, being disposed as he was to show mercy to many, Jesus makes that payment so that God might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in his son. That's what Paul tells us in Romans 3 verse 26. Through the cross, Jesus was going to reveal his father's mercy and grace in justifying the ungodly. When Jesus went to the cross, it wasn't so that people might work their way to heaven and come up to God on the last day and say, look what a great person I am. Look at all the good things that I've done. All these good deeds that I've done should outweigh the bad deeds that I've done, so you should let me into heaven. Now, the Bible says that God's grace and mercy is so great that he justifies the ungodly. That is, personally, we are not perfect. Personally, we are not godly, but God still declares us just. Now, he does that because of Christ's righteousness given to us as a free gift when we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's not because of ours. That's why God is said to justify the ungodly. Those who are not perfect in themselves through his own perfect righteousness, Jesus then glorifies the Father by making that possible. And through his cross, through his mercy and his grace, uh, that would be declared to the entire world. Jesus was going to make that possible so that 
men from every nation might hear and they might believe and they might honor the only true God. You know, every time I see, you know, films, you know, you see films about people in different country worshiping different gods, people in China worshiping Buddha or in India worshiping Krishna or whatever it, it may be, how can you escape the fact that they are worshiping false deities and that that worship is going to cement them in their path towards hell? Well, Jesus went to the cross so that he might free all men from these deceptions, from gods that cannot save them, from idols. There is only one true God. And that is not Buddha, and it's not Krishna, and it's not Allah, although Allah is simply a word for God. It's not the Muslim conception or Islamic conception of God or any of the other false gods. It's the God of the Bible. This is the only true God. Well, this is what Jesus tells us in John 12, verse 32. And we just read it actually earlier. He says, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth will draw all men to myself. And it goes on to say he said that to indicate by what kind of death he would glorify God. When Jesus was lifted up on the cross, then that would be the means to draw men from every nation. Why do we do the work of missions? It's to tell them what Jesus Christ has done so that they might be saved. If they could be saved in all these other ways by worshiping false gods and, and coming to God any way they want by their works or by... Again, the works, whatever false religion they might be involved in, then they could have come that way. God would have allowed them to come that way, but he wouldn't have made his son suffer his wrath on the cross, suffer hell on the cross, if man could come some other way. There's only one way, and that's why Jesus had to die. And having died on the cross, the father is not going to dishonor his son by saying, you don't have to trust in my son. You can come in these other ways. They're fine. Well, then what the father put his son through, he put him through for nothing, you see, if man could come some other way. So Jesus was going, he's asking for strength to glorify his father so he might be lifted up on the cross so the good news of the gospel might be proclaimed everywhere. Now, again, Jesus asked what he was asking for so that he might honor his father. That was his goal. That was his purpose. That was his motive behind everything that he did. Now, that is our example. That is our example. Now, by way of application, let me just make uh, three that have to do with what it is we're looking at. And again, they're brief. So from, from this, let's first of all learn from Jesus how we can pray. Before we ask the Father for any of his blessings, let's first of all humble ourselves and ask forgiveness, confess our sins, repent of our sins, Look to Jesus again to cleanse us of our sins and to clothe us with his righteousness by faith. And let me just remind you, this is the starting point for anyone to be heard by God. I know that people in the world believe that they can pray and ask God for anything and that God is bound to hear them. He's not bound to hear anyone. We read earlier that he's not. If we love our sins, if we're unwilling to repent, God is not going to hear us. That's what he said. The only prayer that God's going to listen to to begin with is a prayer of repentance. Forgive me for my sins and receive me for the sake of, my, of, of your son. If you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, that is where you have to begin, is by repentance and by faith. Now, as Christians, having confessed our sins and having been cleansed and again renewed, as it were, clothed with His righteousness, and again, it's not that we're never, we're never naked in Christ, we always have His righteousness, but we do have to have those imperfections removed that do, in some sense, break fellowship or bring us under discipline. We do need to confess our sins. Then we lift up our eyes to heaven and ask for the Father for the things that we want in the name of His Son, and He will give them to us. But let's remember that when we pray, let's pray for the things we need to glorify Him. That's what we should be seeking for in our prayers. Let's pray for strength. Let's pray for ability. Let's pray for gifts that the Lord might have to give us resources, opportunities to serve Him, to glorify Him. Now again, when Jesus says, glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you, He was looking forward to the glory the Father had promised him in heaven. 
And he says, give me the strength to make it there. Well, you know, the Lord has promised to all of his children, the Lord has promised to all of his children glory in heaven, which is a part of reward, differing levels of glory. So there's a sense in which we are on our way to glory, to receive a certain portion of glory, and we can pray then in a certain sense like Jesus does, give me the strength to attain that. Give me grace. Give me strength. Give me power to, to do this. And certainly the Lord is very willing to give us what it is He wants us to have. I mean, that's what He wants us to do. So that's what He's going to give us when we ask. And then finally, let's check our hearts and make sure that when we do ask, for whatever we ask, that we do have the right motive. The ultimate goal behind everything we ask is that God might be glorified. Now, I've been laboring that through the whole service. This should be the only goal behind everything we do, is that God might be glorified. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now, in the context, the eating and drinking has to do with, you know, whether you're you know, stumbling a brother or not, and, you know, by the various things that you're eating, and it had to do particularly with meat offered to idols and things like that, but, but the principle is, is still valid, whether then you eat or drink, or whatever you do, okay, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Do you think Jesus did that? You know, isn't, isn't that the kind of life He lived? Doing everything He did, offering it up to the Father. Isn't that what Paul is telling us that we need to do as Christians when he says, offer yourselves up as living sacrifices? acceptable to God? Well, Jesus is our example, and we have explicit command from the Lord. That is what we are to be after in everything we do. So in our prayers, that's what we need to have as our goal, is the glory of God. Even when we pray for somebody else's health, needs to be met, salvation to be offered. It's not, it shouldn't just center on that person or that particular need, although certainly we need to love our neighbors ourselves. But ultimately, Lord, answer this prayer so that you would receive glory in it. This person may glorify you for their salvation. This person may glorify you for their, their sickness being healed or their needs being met or whatever it may be. Or if, if I do this good deed, this service to a brother or sister, that they might glorify you for that service that I rendered to you. But not that they would glorify me, you see. Not that I would feel better about it necessarily, although I will feel better about somebody being saved, somebody being healed, some needs being met. Because, again, I'm, I'm to love my neighbors myself. But ultimately, the goal needs to be the glory of God. Now, if that's why we're asking, the Lord will give it to us. Now, secondly, I want us to see again, and we're going to see this much more as we go through, but let's stop just for a moment and see the love that Jesus has for us here. Why was Jesus asking the Father for the strength to give Him glory. It was that He might glorify His Father by saving those whom He had chosen, that He might bring many sons and daughters to glory, that He might actually save us because He loves us, because the Father loves us. If we are trusting Him this morning, Jesus was praying for the strength to save you. You see, if you're trusting in Him, that is the love of Christ revealed. And then finally, and again, we could, we're going to spend a lot more time on that last theme because that's the bulk, I think, the burden of this prayer. But finally, let's remember that the Father has already answered this prayer. Okay, I mean, this was given almost 2,000 years ago. The Father answered Him, and He gave Him the strength to do this. Jesus has been to the cross that's why we have the table in front of us this morning. It reminds us that Jesus did the work. He accomplished the work. He has been raised from the dead. That's why we're gathered here this morning on His day of worship, His day of rest in order to honor Him. And, of course, He has ascended and has been glorified as the presence of His Holy Spirit within our hearts continually reminds us if Jesus had not been glorified, the Spirit would not be given. If you are trusting in Him this morning, Jesus' prayer for you has already been answered. This is what He has done for you. And having done that for you, He now welcomes you to come to the table to remember the sacrifice that He made on your behalf 
so that you might know Him, that you might be saved, that you might come into this relationship that we're actually going to be looking at this evening, eternal life, which is not just a quality of life, not just a duration of life, but it's, it's basically a relationship with the Lord. That certainly is a quality, but um, it is a relationship with the Lord that is closer than anything that we have ever experienced. But we'll look at that this evening. Right now, let's think about how the table reminds us that the Father answered Jesus' prayer. Father, glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you. He answered that prayer. Jesus glorified his Father, and now he is glorified in heaven as a reward for what he has done. But the result of that is our salvation. So in preparing to come to the table, let's just think about the different things that we've already seen in this sermon or in, in, in this exposition of this particular verse. And again, regarding repentance, regarding faith in particular. Have we turned from our sins? Have we repented of our sins? Have we repented of all of our sins? And remember, sin is not just doing wrong things in that Jesus says, don't do this and I'm doing it, but not doing the right things. You know, am I, am I doing what it is the Lord has called me to do? Am I following Jesus? And then more particularly, am I doing what I am doing all the time that I am doing it? And even in my prayers, am I asking for the things I'm asking for, for this one particular goal, and that is that God might be glorified. So am I repenting? Am I trusting the Lord Jesus Christ alone for my salvation? And is my life focused on the glory of God? Well, that's what our Lord calls us to. And if, if that is not the life we're living in, again, we all fall short in many different ways. There is forgiveness. There is mercy. We confess our sins. The Lord forgives us of our sins. And He also gives us renewed strength to be able to do what He has called us to do. So what we need to do right now is, is think about, have I repented? Have I trusted Jesus? Am I following Him? Am I seeking to give Him glory? Those are the qualifications to, to come to the table. You don't have to be perfect. You know, we, we do have to be repenting of, the, of our imperfections and our sins that, that we're committing. We need to be willing to put those things off. But, but if the table were, for only, were only for perfect people, then none of us could come, and none of us would dare come to the table. We know that isn't the case. So let's bow in a moment of prayer, and let's prepare to come to the table. And again, if we're not repenting, don't come to the table. There's a warning in Scripture quite plain that we are sinning if we do so, that we, if we don't know Christ, we're simply increasing judgment. If we do know Him, we're going to be disciplined by the Lord for this in one way or another. But if we are repenting and trusting even though imperfect, He welcomes us to come. He tells us to come. He commands us to come and to remember His Son and to look to His Son and to receive from Him the strength to be able to live the kind of life that He calls us to live. Let's, let's 